was asked to talk about BCG. I thought I'd just set the context of why we may want to use BCG, first of all. It's used in a subset of people, men and women with bladder cancer, but a very important subset because they are a group that are particularly at risk of the disease getting out of control and it should be treatable and curable. So appropriate uh, and early treatment is very important for this group. And that's a group that are uh, that are termed often high risk, um, high grade, but not muscle, not invading into the muscle bladder cancers. In other words, they sit mostly on the surface. They've got features of high grade of, in terms of their potential aggression, but they aren't invading deeply into the bladder wall. But they have potential for progressing and spreading if uncontrolled or untreated. In fact, occasionally they can spread and progress without deeply invading, but uh, they're a particular subset that's probably a, a bigger percentage than used to be when I first started training. It's a, a, fair, a fair percentage of patients now present with these high-risk but non-muscle invasive bladder tumours. I'll explain what I mean. Um, non-muscle invasive means that it's sitting in the lining of the bladder without growing into the bladder as, as deep as the muscle. It might just start to uh, get into the first cell layers of the bladder, but it's not gone deeply into the bladder wall. Uh, it's a particular subset and it can be divided into those with low degree of aggression and those that are more aggressive. If the cancer is already invaded into the muscle, it needs approaching in a different way. It's got potential for spreading and therefore is not still treatable just by uh, something within the bladder. If it's spread elsewhere already, it needs some treatment that treats the whole body. So we're gonna talk about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. This is a diagrammatic view. Um, if you look at the ones on the right side of the picture, CIS, carcinoma in situ, or the, the small warty lesions, they're ones that sit in the bladder wall. They've not invaded deeply. Once the cancer starts to grow into the muscle, it's got potential for getting into blood vessels, it's for getting outside and the cells spreading elsewhere in the body. The further it spreads into the muscle, the more risk of that happening there is. So we're talking about ones that are still in the lining of the bladder, but have aggressive potential, um, and not the ones that are deeply through the bladder. Uh, this is a slightly different way of saying the same thing. You've got a series of cells that line the bladder to provide a waterproof lining for the bladder. It separates the urine from the deeper tissues where the blood vessels sit, and from the muscle, which controls how the bladder empties and fills, etc. Uh, these cancers we're talking about are probably either in the surface or may have just gone through the first layer of the bladder wall but haven't got as deep as muscle, so non-muscle invasive. Just a last way of looking at it, uh, you don't want to get to the point where that white tumour is growing through the, through the muscle into, and out of the bladder or even into the muscle where the blood vessels are. Uh, you want to get the cancer when it's still in the line of the bladder and hopefully treatable by treating that bladder lining rather than having to remove the whole bladder or treat with other therapies. So we're talking about uh, tumours that lie within the surface of the bladder, haven't gone as deep as muscle, but may have potential for being more aggressive if they're uncontrolled. Is that clear to everybody? Yeah. And what we normally do is do a cystoscopy, put a telescope in the bladder, do a resection of a TUR bladder tumour, you resect the bladder tumour, hopefully completely, and get some deep muscle to sample it to see if there's evidence of uh, cancer in the deeper muscle. And nowadays that will be probably preceded by a specialist MRI scan that's just coming in like prostate cancer as a way of get a better staging. Uh, you send a little bit of tissue separately often from the muscle to see if there's cancer in it and you may biopsy the uh, other abnormal areas, including in the prostate, to see if there's any evidence of multifocal cancers, because I'll come on to that later. Multiple cancers are more of a risk for progression than a single cancer, for example. And you shouldn't forget that the upper tracts, including the lining of the kidneys and the ureters, both have similar potential for forming tumours to the bladder, so they should also have some form of investigation, such as a scan, at some point. So that's what we do initially. A lot of you may have had that done already, I suspect. Uh, and then you can divide patients according to what you see into low, intermediate, and high risk. High risk is based on the grade of the cancer and whether it's showing early signs of growing into the bladder wall but not getting as far as muscle. And they're the ones we're interested in because the high risk means they're more likely to come back 
And if they're not controlled properly, they're more likely to progress, grow into the muscle and spread elsewhere. Uh, I keep emphasizing that because they are a particular group of patients that worry me that sometimes in the past have perhaps been not followed up as close as they could be and uh, therefore not um, perhaps have the optimal treatment. So non-muscle invasive bladder cancer can do two things. It can keep coming back, it can recur. Now recurrence by itself isn't life-threatening, but it requires repeated intervention. It's uh, unpleasant. You need cystoscopies and resections regularly, sometimes chemotherapy. But recurrence by itself is not always a sign that the disease has gone wrong. What we don't want is progression, that you see more disease appearing or it's getting deeper into the muscle or eventually it shows signs of spreading. Because that means it's progressed to a point where treatment's more difficult. So two things can happen. It can recur or it can progress. And there is a relationship a little bit between the two, but progression is the thing that worries us. Recurrence can be usually kept under control. Um, and what we try and do is predict which ones are at higher risk of progression, and that determines what we do in terms of treatment, for example, with BCG. Uh, I'll skip that. So just to emphasize again, if you've got non-invasive bladder cancer, it means the risk of recurrence is high if it's a high risk one, the risk of progression and growth into the bladder is high, but ultimately if it's not controlled, it means the risk of disease getting elsewhere or actually getting to the point where it threatens life is also higher. So the intention is to try and deal with them earlier to try and stop these things happening. And again, that's where I'll come back to BCG as being one of the few proven treatments that can do that. Um, and just to say what also defines high risk and why you might want to use BCG is number of tumours. Multiple tumours are worse than one tumour. Bigger tumours are worse than small tumours. If the cancer keeps coming back, uh, that's a very high risk factor, uh, particularly if it kept comes back after previous treatment. Uh, if it's, The deeper it grows in the bladder wall, the higher risk it is. Whether there's cancer cells in the bladder wall away from the tumours, can't cast them in situ, and ultimately the grade of the cancer, high grade, grade three cancer. So the worst group, you sometimes see people who've got a form of malignant cystitis, they've got multiple tumours all over the bladder, they've got carcinoma in situ, they keep coming back. They've, that's quite a high risk for something going badly wrong with that bladder. So you put all those factors together. These are the ones that need early attention and are the ones that would need, for example, to consider early intervention with BCG and perhaps other treatments. And that's just to show if you look at a risk model, if you've got a low risk cancer at the top, the white one, after 10 years or more, 100% are still free of progression. If you get a very high risk cancer, the multiple ones, high grade cancers keep coming back. The green line, by six years, almost all of them are progressed if they don't treat them successfully. So, so basically, you can start to predict what might happen to the cancer and try and jump on the higher risk ones earlier and more aggressively. Uh, and one, I put this in just to show you that the early cystoscopies and re repeat cystoscopy are very important. But several papers have shown that if you've got cancer present after the first resection at three months, with no treatment, or particularly even worse if you've had treatment and the cancer comes back, your risk of progression is much higher and it should be taken seriously. That you, maybe you need to move on to more aggressive treatment because those tumours are showing themselves as being aggressive tumours. So really important to have regular cystoscopies and biopsies because you'll pick up those that aren't responding or showing signs of being bad cancers. Uh, okay, I'll flip through that one. So what can we do to prevent recurrence and progression? Well, the, I've already said the re repeated checks of the bladder with resection and biopsy to identify recurrence. You can put chemotherapy in the bladder. Again, some of you have probably had that and that probably can reduce recurrence, but whether it stops the cancers progressing or not is highly debatable. Immunotherapy, BCG, in other words, is the one proven treatment in this space. There are more um, innovative treatments such as photodynamic therapy, uh, light therapy, in other words, and preventative measures, stopping smoking, uh, drinking more fluids, for example. And at the bottom, early radical therapy, there is a strong argument in some bladders, even if the cancer hasn't deeply invaded, for actually removing it early before it gets chance to become really bad. You know, we've got a multiple tumours everywhere in the bladder with a lot of symptoms with the, the, the keep coming back, leaving a lot of evidence. If you leave radical treatment like the cystectomy too long, the results of treatment will be far worse. So I think you've got to identify the very bad bladders very early as well. 
it shows the bottom line is if you do nothing else besides cut the tumour away over the first five years, um, probably more than half have, have come back again. And this is even with low risk tumours. If you give a single shot of chemotherapy, it's probably about only about 40% um, uh, have come back. And if you give a course of five lots of chemotherapy, uh, probably only uh, 25 to 30% are recurred. So you can stop them coming back by just giving chemotherapy in the bladder. This is low risk tumors, however, it probably doesn't stop the bad ones going wrong, however, unfortunately. So chemotherapy is a useful way of reducing the need for resections for lower risk tumors. It doesn't really stop progression. David, uh, here's a question which is relevant at this point. Is the, is the location of tumors in the bladder indicative of the likelihood to recur or progress? Not by itself, but there are uh, the various theories. I mean, tumors tend to form at the back and the base of the bladder uh, initially, and the recurrences tend to be all over the place. There's a, there's a seed theory that in some ways the tumors act as like weeds almost. They sort of break into a field effect around the bladder. And it's possible by resecting some of them, you actually also help spread those tumor cells around. And what washing the bladder out with chemotherapy does is kill off those floating tumor cells, probably. So the initial presentation is uh, is uh, not so important as understanding that you're possibly by biopsying the tumor, actually helping flick a few tumor cells around. And the chemotherapy is just killing off those floating tumor cells to stop them seeding. It's like a garden, basically. You've got initial tumor cells and it's acting as a, you know, the, the, the weed is acting as a propagator for other tumors falling elsewhere in the bladder. So this, the chemotherapy is just probably stopping, reducing that potential for getting into other bits of the bladder. So Thank you. Answer the question. No. It does. Uh, again, if you're going to use chemotherapy, a single shot reduces recurrence and a course of five reduces the risk of recurrence, but probably in the lower risk tumors. Interesting, mitomycin C is used worldwide, apart from Australia, where it's not actually covered by PBS for some reason. And gentamicin is, is for, which is a more expensive agent, which doesn't make any sense to me, but uh, Australia has its own way of doing things in the uh, PBS and public sector. So worldwide, mitomycin C is by far the commonest chemotherapy agent used, but uh, not so much in Australia. In fact, it's possible if you use water, you might get the same effect as chemotherapy if it's just to kill tumor cells off, but uh, that's uh, another issue. So why, why would we move from chemotherapy to BCG? Um, I might just flick forward. So the first question I think you've got to say, what is BCG? Well, it's Bacillus calmenguerin. It's uh, the stuff that probably people of a certain age, including me when we were teenagers, were inoculated against TB with. You, know, you had the Heath test and then they gave you a shot in the arm and you get a red lump there for a while. It's a live bacteria that mimics t tuberculosis and it's used to inoculate you against TB. It actually sets up an inflammatory reaction. That's, and I'll explain that in a second, but it is basically a live bacteria. I've just put this in because I think it's quite amusing. Why six doses? Because the guy that uh, described it in 1975, who came up with the concept, which is good, that people were looking at other ways of doing BCG. One of my bosses at the time was looking, well, I wasn't in medicine in 1975. I was just a teenager, but um, whatever Kelly says. Um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 if you're going to promote an immune response, you have to expose somebody to it more than once. You give them the first uh, exposure and then subsequent ones to stimulate the immune system, which is what BCG does. It just so happened that BCG came in a six pack. So, uh, so basically, yeah, the, the, when he started the treatment, he gave six doses. Um, it's probably just as logical to give give five or seven to be honest but uh, but but not one or two or three you've got to give a few doses to get the immune response so that's why several doses are used and it's a live bacteria i'll come back to that in a second so bcg treatment is given into the bladder obviously uh, through a catheter usually with some local anesthetic jelly uh, and it's uh, there are one or two issues with BCG and that there are every now and again production problems with the companies that drug companies that make it and they become world shortages and you can't get it for a while you have to look at alternatives or people talk about giving reduced dose BCG there's some evidence that reduced dose may be as effective as full dose but essentially full dose but you give the treatment for bladder through a catheter you uh, um uh, same in a man or a woman it's slightly more difficult to get in the catheter than a man perhaps but uh it's delivered directly in there and it's left in to slop around the bladder for at least an hour or so. Um, 
some of our nursing colleagues get the people to lie on the bed for then turn every 15 minutes off the side of the front to make sure the whole bladder's covered. My view is that if people feel like walking around, you'll get the same effect anyway. If people go and exercise, they'll get the bladder uh, to uh, fill up. Of course, if you, as with chemotherapy, if you have drunk a lot and you start to, uh, your bladder starts to fill with urine, you both feel uncomfortable, but also it'll dilute the effect. So it's probably best not to uh, drink uh, a vast amount just before you have the treatments because it will uh, fill your bladder up with urine as well as BCG or chemotherapy, if that's what you're having, and they will get perhaps less coverage of the bladder wall. But essentially, it's designed to put the BCG solution in contact with the bladder surface for a period of at least an hour, maybe 90 minutes. And, and it therefore then goes on to have its effect. Some of you may have had this done. How does it work? I'm not expecting you to, I, mean, I don't really understand this, to be honest. But if you look at the, the brown things at the front, that's the bladder lining, there are cells there. If you give BCG, the BCG sort of attaches itself to the cells with various things like fibronectin. It sort of, and it, by doing so, it sets off a chain of signals to uh, to the body's immune system, and all this stuff at the bottom, interleukins, um, all the, these things are basically inflammatory products that are, that are produced by the BCE setting off an immune reaction. Um, so basically, the BCG attaches to the bladder wall. It sets off signals through the cells, and the body produces an immune response. And these things, as say IL one, IL six, etc., are inflammatory responders, which are strong. Um, uh, anti-inflammatory substances that that can uh, stimulate cells in the body to produce an anti-tumor effect, but basically it produces killer killer tumor effect, which kill kills off tumor cells by stimulating this whole process of of the uh, in the immune system, and all that really just shows a very complicated system whereby various of these interleukins and and anti sort of inflammatory uh, products actually set off certain cells in the body to produce killer effects on the cancer cells, and that's how it's supposed to work. It's a non-specific effect. Um, you, people used to try injecting BCG into the bladder wall, or one of my bosses used to uh, take pig lymphocytes and inject them into the bladder, which is trying to do the same thing. It's trying to stimulate the body to produce an immune response, and then it, that's, it effect, the effect of that is to produce, uh, anti, uh, produce cells that are will kill off tumor cells as well as other things. It produces, but as a side effect, of course, it can produce inflammation and give inflammatory side effects. So I, don't, I just put that to remind myself to say that what you do with BCG is stimulating the body to fight off the cancer cells and kill cancer cells. So just a couple of things about BCG, and you probably have questions about that, but yeah, BCG, it can be contagious. Uh, the pharmacists are very careful with it because they have were one or two uh, Episode certainly in the UK where they mixed it in, uh, meant this is decades ago, mixed it in uh, in a sterile uh, environment and it contaminated uh, chemotherapy drugs to be given into the uh, spinal fluid for children and uh, gave them TB. It was a couple of cases, so you have to be careful you don't contaminate people who are immunosuppressed or young people with it. Uh, the effect's fairly short lived in most people, so it's uh, you know, when you've had it, it's dilute it, wash it through, pee it out, but uh, you're usually told to put some bleach in the loo and don't use public toilets. And if you are leaking or having continence to uh, wash your, your clothes away from other people's clothes, it's mainly to stop contaminating children more than anything else. Um, the effect's relatively short-lived um, and it can affect sexual function. Uh, mainly because in a man, particularly the prostate is part of the urinary tract, even though it's a sexual organ. You know, prostate, remember, is a sexual organ. You ejaculate through it, but it is also part of the urinary tract as well. So they're just, these instructions in some way should be given to people after they've had each BCG treatment, uh, usually for about uh, six hours, it's said afterwards to make sure you, uh, you, uh, you uh, decontaminate the loo, but not for much longer than that. Okay. What about side effects? Yes, there are. A lot of people get some irritating side effects. I mean, by definition, you're setting up an inflammatory response to, that's how the cancer cells are killed off. Uh, it's not unusual to get some side effects, a little bit of blood in the pee, maybe a low-growth feed, but certainly some irritation of the bladder, a bit of burning, frequent urination. Um, that's one reason why it's probably not a great idea to, to have BCG if you're 
if you've just had a resection of the bladder tumor in the last few days and there's still a raw area in the bladder, or you've had a recent urine infection, and a lot of the time the nurses will check you out for urine infections uh, prior to coming in for the BCG. Um, you know, if you start with an inflamed raw bladder and then you put a substance on it which is designed to produce inflammation, you're going to get more side effects. Uh, but, and most of these side effects are mild, though, and obviously, when you're um, affected by them, no side effect is mild if it's making you feel, um, feel bad, but uh, you know, it's short term for most people. Uh, I've got to be fair, there are a small number of people. Look, I've, I've seen probably hundreds, possibly even thousands of people on BCG over the last 25 years. See, it's rare to see a major side effect, but I have seen one or two people who've uh, had a very high fevers or even in one case, a tuberculosis-like infection, generally. Uh, some European centers used to give anti-tuberculous therapy to their patients before BCG. It's not standard practice, though. Um, certainly in most in the UK and Australia it wouldn't be, but some European centre used to give uh, you know, one of the anti-tuberculous drugs alongside BCG. There's no great evidence for that. You are going to be treating then hundreds of people, perhaps to stop one person getting it, and whether it actually does stop them getting TB or not is debatable. Uh, I've seen tuberculomas, which are tuberculous like lumps or masses in the scrotum in three people uh, over my lifetime. So you can occasionally get what are called tuberculomas, where you get like a mass. I mean, usually you just take it, remove it. It's not uh, it's, just, it's not a disease that affects the whole body. Um, rarely, I think I've seen it or heard of it once. You can get a major reaction to BCG, and that can be uh, you know even involve going to intensive care and being quite sick. It's rare, very rare, but rare events happen very occasionally. So it's uh, um, most of these more severe and uh, lower down uh, side effects are pretty rare. Uh, things like bladder contracture or the ureters obstructing. Uh, I've seen that more often with chemotherapy, actually. I don't think I've really seen it with BCG, but I've seen people who have consistent, you know, repeated bladder tumor resection followed by repeated chemotherapy occasionally get small contracted scarred bladders that need removing for the effect of treatments and not for the effect of the cancer. I think that's pretty rare after BCG, to be honest. So those are the more, some of the more severe side effects, and they are quite uncommon, but obviously not unknown. Uh, uh, I'm just pleased to remind me more than anything else to show there is evidence in trials that BCG is more effective. Uh, I, uh, let me just use this one. This is all the trial, a lot of the trials have been done. There's a line on the right with black bits. If it's left of the line, it means that BCG is better than chemotherapy. If it's right of the line, it means that chemotherapy is better than BCG. In terms of recurrence, BCG always is better than chemotherapy. We always think recurrence isn't the main worry with the high grade tumors, which is a worry. If you look at progression, um, there are very few good studies, actually, but there's an overall analysis of almost 5,000 people which shows that BCG with maintenance is far superior to giving no BCG in terms of stopping progression. And no BCG usually meant chemotherapy, mitomycin C. So there's quite significant uh, uh, added value from BCG over chemotherapy if, you, if your prime aim is to stop the cancer going bad. It doesn't mean to say that BCG is perfect by any means, but it just means to say that it's a better option than mitomycin C. So in terms of cancer treatment, there is evidence based on 5,000 people that BCG has advantages. Notice it says maintenance, though. Just six doses by itself isn't enough. Um, I think the next slide. BCG maintenance, there are trials have looked at giving BCG just six doses versus BCG for a year versus BCG for three years. And maintenance for at least a year, with some advantage, perhaps up to three years, is better than just having six, you know, a course of six. And there's people could argue about what maintenance means. It could be six plus three, or six plus three plus three, or the original trials actually gave BCG every three months, then every six months for three years. Um, the trouble was only one in six people ever finished the whole three years, because most people got fed up having the BCG. So in fact, probably three years is too long for most people. But certainly at least a year's worth of BCG is probably an advantage over just a course of six. Well, I'm just going to say, basically, what do you do with BCG? BCG failure is, is, is defined in different ways. But if you get significant cancer recurring, even after the first course of BCG, you have to start being concerned about it. Certainly, if you have two courses of BCG and the cancer is still coming back, even in small amounts, 
you have to be concerned that that cancer is showing itself to be resistant to treatment. Uh, so obesity, you know, I, in the, somebody with, who has BCG and at the first cystoscopy has got a lot more disease coming back. I'd be worried about that. You know, multiple tumors, carcinoma in situ. If it's a small amount of disease, but you've had two lots of treatment or some maintenance, it's still coming back. Uh, I mean, some studies have shown that if you do get recurrence after BCG, if you just leave it and watch it, the people are 20 times more likely to uh, uh, progress and die early of the disease than if you actually uh, uh, don't get recurrence after BCG. So failure to respond to BCG is by itself a bad sign. Uh, you sometimes have to make a clinical judgment on how, how what that failure is. Is it very extensive? Is it worth carrying on with the BCG and getting control? But uh, if you're getting cancer despite BCG, yeah, we have to be very careful in discussion about what that means and whether it means a change of course or not. Okay. And you can try the chemotherapy agents. There are some studies that suggest giving chemotherapy alongside BCG or after it might improve the chance of the response. And there are new therapies, many of which are parts of trials now, in fact, most are, are parts of trials, which can be accessed through trials units, like the one at, uh, at Macquarie, where we've got a couple of trials of BCG failures. Um, and, and that is an option to look at if, if you get persistent cancer despite BCG. Some of the newer agents, or many, most, many of which are also designed to look at more targeted immune therapy, immunotherapy, rather than this BCG, which is quite non-specific. It's a bit of a blunderbuss compared to targeting specific areas, okay? Yes. If your cancer is not coming to control with BCG or, or other therapies that might be used, the longer you wait to get your bladder removed, the more risk that the disease isn't going to be controlled. And there are studies that have looked at people, for example, this says 12 weeks. There are other studies that have looked at people who have been ongoing for two years with treatment in the bladder compared to though getting their bladders out. There are others who've carried on more than two years trying to keep it under control, it's not controlled. And there's a significant fall off in survival the longer you wait if your disease isn't controlled. At some point, some people need to make the decision about whether they should bite the bullet and remove the bladder if they've got disease that is bad and it's not responding to BCG or some of the newer treatments. This is one example. If you were uh, the people not responding uh, with bad disease, if you uh, if you wait, waited after decision for more than 12 weeks, the outcome was far less good than getting it sorted out within three months. Uh, that's a bit dr 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 dramatic because other studies have quoted your know, periods of a, a year of a, less than a year versus more than a year of, of, of treatment. Uh, the, well, the answer is if you've got one that's not responding, if you wait too long, you might have a negative, have a worse, much worse outcome in terms of cancer cure uh, or control. So it's a decision that needs to be made with your doctor if you're not getting good response to the, the treatment in your bladder. And the disease keeps coming back. At what point do you say that it should be going down a different route? People have got various pathways. It's all a bit complicated, but essentially, cancer is a journey, and you have to decide which pathway you're going down. The high risk one on the right, you can you use BCG and treatment the bladder. Some you end up having to go down the route of uh, more radical treatment.